Biographical sketch of George B. McClellan from McClellan's Own Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. Biographical Sketch of George B. McClellan by W.C. Prime, L.L.D. Life, Services, and Character of George B. McClellan George Brinton McClellan, son of George McClellan, M.D., and Elizabeth Brinton McClellan, was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, December 3, 1826. His school education was in that city. In 1841 and 1842, in the preparatory school attached to the University of Pennsylvania. He entered the Military Academy at West Point in 1842, graduating in 1846, when he was assigned to the Corps of Engineers as second lieutenant. In September of the same year, he went with the Army to Mexico, where he served with distinction during the war. He was breveted first lieutenant for gallantry at Contreras and Churubusco, captain for Chapultepec. At the close of the Mexican War, he commanded the Engineer Company and brought it to West Point, where he served with it, acting also as Assistant Instructor of Practical Engineering until 1851. In that year, he superintended the construction of Fort Delaware. In 1852, he accompanied Captain R. B. Marcy on the Red River Exploring Expedition. In 1853 and 1854, he was on duty in Washington Territory and Oregon as an engineer officer, exploring a proposed route for the Pacific Railroad. In the spring of 1855, the government sent a commission of army officers to Europe, instructed to obtain and report information on military service in general and the practical working of changes then recently made in military systems. The commission was specially instructed to give attention to the organization of armies, transports for men and horses, embarking and disembarking them, hospitals and ambulances, clothing and camp equipage, arms and ammunition, fortifications and seacoast defenses, engineering operations of a siege in all its branches, siege trains, bridge trains, boats, wagons, in short, to study and report on the whole art of war in Europe. As the Crimean War was then in progress, and the British and French forces were besieging Sebastopol, this was an important point for the objects of the commission which consisted of three officers, Major R. Delafield, Major A. Mordecai, and Captain G. B. McClellan. They proceeded to Europe in the spring of 1855, amply accredited to American representatives and the several governments on whose courtesy they would have to depend for opportunities of study and observation. The British government extended to them every possible courtesy. From the French and the Russian, they could obtain no facilities. They were received in the Crimea with soldierly kindness by General Simpson, who had succeeded Lord Raglan in command of the British forces. Here they had ample opportunity for the study of military operations on a grand scale. Leaving the Crimea in November, they pursued their duties in various European states. The list of military posts and fortresses which they examined is very long, abounding in names illustrious in the history of wars. McClellan's report on the arms, equipments, and organization of the three arms was, says a distinguished soldier, a model of conciseness and accurate information, and added to his already brilliant reputation. It may be noted, as an interesting fact, that the Secretary of War, who issued the elaborate instructions to this commission and selected its members for their special ability and fitness, was Jefferson Davis. Five years later, when he was at the head of a political and military rebellion, one of the commissioners utilized his experience and information in organizing and leading the armies of the Union for its suppression. In January 1857, McClellan, then captain in the 1st Cavalry, resigned his commission and accepted employment, first as chief engineer, afterward as vice president, of the Illinois Central Railroad Company. Later he became president of the Eastern Division of the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad Company. On the 22nd of May, 1860, he married Ellen Mary Marcy, daughter of Captain, afterward General, Randolph B. Marcy, and established his residence at Cincinnati, Ohio, 
where he was occupied in his business when the Civil War began, and he offered his services to his country. No volunteer in the army made greater personal sacrifices. He was in the enjoyment of a large income. His prospects in life were brilliant. Like all soldiers of the old army, he had led a wandering life with no one place to call a home. He had now, for the first time, made for himself a place of rest with his young wife, in which they were gathering those personal belongings which go so far to make life happy and rest delightful. The sacrifices of the soldier's wife are as great, often greater, than those of the husband. McClellan's wife was a soldier's daughter. The spirit of obedience to the call of duty ruled them both alike. No words can fitly express the perfectness of that love which was the light of both their lives. It was expressed in a few lines of his letters which I have suffered to appear in this volume, in a thousand passages and words which are omitted. His life from April 1861 to November 1862 forms the subject of this narrative, which I have entitled, McClellan's Own Story. He was commissioned Major General of Volunteers in Ohio on the 23rd of April, 1861. On the 14th of May, he was made Major General in the United States Army and placed in command of the Department of the Ohio. On the 26th of May, he issued a proclamation to the Union men of Western Virginia, and an address to his soldiers whom he led to what has been known as the Western Virginia Campaign. On the 22nd of July, having freed Western Virginia from secessionists and preserved its people to the Union, he was summoned to Washington, and, arriving there on the 26th, was assigned to command the Division of the Potomac. He found Washington in a perilous condition. The defeat at Bull Run had demoralized the administration and the army. No one had formed any, the most vague, idea of what was to be done or how to do anything. Up to this time, the administration had shared with the people of the North, and an unconsidering press, the opinion that the rebellion was but a mob, to be scattered in one or two free fights by impetuous onsets of patriotic men. Now the shout, on to Richmond, had been suddenly and appallingly hushed. Paralysis had followed. Not even Scott or McDowell, or any military adviser of the administration and people, had thought of making ordinary military provision for the defense of Washington against an enemy whose shell might at any moment shatter the dome of the capital. The military condition of the whole country, Western Virginia alone excepted, was chaotic. Probably there were other men in America as well fitted by natural ability and education for the great work at hand, but they did not appear. No other one has been indicated as the proper man for the occasion. That occasion demanded a calm foresight of the vast needs of the country in the coming and then present peril, the ability to provide for every one of them, and, the expression is homely but precise, the staying power to made the provision perfectly, calmly, completely, unmoved by the cries, however honest and anxious, of an alarmed people, equally unmoved by the criticisms of the envious and the clamors of the unprincipled. If the wisdom which sought the ablest military advice in that moment of alarm had been displayed throughout the war by entrusting to military knowledge and ability the conduct of campaigns, and the direction and execution of the work of war, the expense of treasure and blood would have been vastly less, and the end would have been much more speedy. Instead of this, after McClellan had assured the safety of the capital, and the alarm of the civilians had subsided, they assumed the direction, interfered with, and delayed military preparations, and undertook the specific management of campaigns and armies, while they took care that the delays and defeats which they caused should be charged on soldiers in the field. We who were then living can with the utmost difficulty carry our minds back to the conditions under which McClellan was called to save the capital and country. It is impossible for the present generation to realize the blindness of the people or appreciate the prevision of the young general. We now look back to all that which he foresaw, foretold, and provided for. So intense had been popular feeling that it was regarded as treason to think or say that secession was in great strength, that the South would not be easily conquered. He was alone in the clear atmosphere, above the scene of physical and political warfare, and saw what others could not or would not see. Mr. Lincoln probably came nearer to accepting his views than anyone else. 
From this time on, the President reposed confidence in him, and there is small reason for doubt that, but for the interference of politicians, Lincoln and McClellan would have brought the war to an end in the summer of 1862. But Mr. Lincoln soon had two wars on his hands. He was at the head of the Union and at the head of a political party. Both were threatened with division. He desired to save both, probably believing that the unity of his party was essential to the saving of the country. In this view can be explained much which is otherwise inexplicable in his dealings with the general, to whom up to the very last he gave the most frank and full private assurances of his confidence. The staying powers of McClellan were the salvation of the Union. Alone in his outlook, he was alone in the execution of his great work. The fortification of Washington accomplished, and a sufficient force organized and disciplined for its defense. He directed his labors to the next great need, an army. The people, the sovereigns, had not the remotest conception of the meaning of the word army. Very few soldiers in this country had grasped the idea. No one but McClellan had observed that the able and educated soldiers of the South had long been organizing that vast machine which, once created, moves with irresistible force over all obstacles until met by another machine of like construction and greater power or which is handled with greater skill. The Army of the Potomac grew like a vast engine constructed by a master mind. Its history is the reward of the constructor, ample, and the only reward he ever received. There was one characteristic of McClellan's mind, which some would regard as a defect, and which certainly placed him at a disadvantage in his relations with the men in Washington. He was slow to suspect evil of any man. This trait was exhibited in his private life, and he never wholly lost it. The philosophic reader will find interest in the indications afforded in his letters of his gradual awakening to the controlling presence in Washington of a class of men known as politicians. Soldiers, accustomed to honest service for definite purposes, imbued with high principles of honor, can with difficulty recognize the existence of men in public life who are willing to manage public interests for private or party gain. He knew the past history of his country by heart. He remembered the illustrious names and records of men whose high ambition had been to serve the people as statesmen, whom no one had ever thought to charge with personal or party motive in any of their acts as trustees and representatives of the people. Was the day of such American senators and representatives gone by? Was legislation henceforth to be for the perpetuation of hold on office, for the success of party, with a mere pretense of good to country? Now that the general trust of governmental powers had become a specific trust of blood to be poured out and treasured be expended for the salvation of the Union, it did not occur to him that any of the trustees could dream of using that treasure and blood for personal advantage. When men professed honest patriotism, he believed them. Nor do the people themselves, in times of excitement, yield readily to the belief that among their leaders are some who are not honest and patriotic. But, in calm retrospect, they are generally more wise. It would not be difficult already to make a catalogue of names of men who were prominent in Washington and elsewhere during the war, who secured for the time the reputation of patriotic leaders of opinion and directors of events, whose memories have been allowed, as they deserved, to rot. All our history demonstrates how such men abound, and secure influence and power at every seat of government, municipal and general, wherever patronage is to be distributed and money to be expended. They are very ignorant indeed who imagine that, in the greatest opportunity for such men ever afforded in America, there were none of them at the front. They were legion. The history of the war is inextricably involved with the history of party politics. No one can understand the former without knowledge of the latter. Nor can the great services of McClellan be in any way estimated, his marvelous steadfastness in duty, his Herculean work in Washington, and his brilliant career at the head of the Army of the Potomac, without giving full value to the fact that, from a short time after his arrival in Washington, politicians formed an enemy in his rear, often more formidable to him and his army, than the enemy in their front, toward whom alone the eyes of the people were then directed. The Republican Party which re-elected Mr. Lincoln in 1864 was not the same party, either in principles or in voters, which had elected him in 1860. 
the democratic party of later years is not in any aspect the party of mr buchanan's time old issues were dead annihilated by the fire on fort sumter the republican party machinery existed the machine politics held it in hand and ardent partisans throughout the country kept up a semblance of party distinction by denouncing all opponents as sympathizers with secession and traitors but in the early summer of eighteen sixty one there was but one party in the north the party of the union and constitution here and there was a southern sympathizer whose utterances furnished material for newspapers and orators to grow wild about but the number of these was insignificant the entire body of the northern people were united in one sentiment and this enthusiastic unanimity was the more wonderful because there had been a very widespread sympathy in the north with the doctrine of secession on which the leaders of the south had based much expectation this sympathy was not in one political party alone startling as the statement may be to some the fact is easily demonstrated that there had been as many if not more secessionists among northern republicans than democrats there is no more trustworthy indication of a man's political opinions than the doctrines taught by the newspaper he takes regularly and reads religiously one powerful northern journal taught that the right of secession was as clear as the rights asserted in the declaration of independence that a union pinned together by bayonets was not worth having that the erring sisters ought to be let go this journal claimed and had two hundred thousand subscribers which implies at least a half million regular readers a large part of whom accepted the doctrine of secession there was a body of men in the north of considerable numbers known as the abolitionists who had steadily advocated disunion their motto being the constitution of the united states is a league with death and a covenant with hell many of them were voters with the republican party it is therefore unquestionable that a considerable portion of the republican party had been indoctrinated into a belief not only of the right but of the desirableness of the secession of the southern states that a considerable portion of the democrats had held the same view no one doubts but the challenge to arms was accepted by republicans and democrats with one voice and act all sympathy with secession vanished and it would be absurd now to deny that there was as many democrats as republicans among the volunteer soldiery of the war the people and the army thought of one subject only the suppression of the rebellion while politicians democrats as well as republicans look to the spoils of present power and the means of confirming that power in future elections congress at the moment of mcclellan's arrival in washington as if to instruct him in his duty expressed the unanimous sentiment of the north in a resolution which declared that the present deplorable civil war has been forced upon the country by the disunionists of the southern states now in revolt against the constitutional government and in arms around the capital that in this national emergency congress banishing all feeling of mere passion or resentment will recollect only its duty to the country that this war is not waged on our part in any spirit of oppression nor for any purpose of conquest or subjugation nor purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institutions of those states but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the constitution and to preserve the union with all the dignity equality and rights of the several states unimpaired and as soon as these objects are accomplished this war ought to cease mcclellan accepted this instruction it expressed his own views and those of every lover of his country in the north but if this purpose were achieved in this way the southern states kept in the union by a strong hand would reappear in future elections as a solid south against the machine politicians who had gained power in 1860. If the white vote could be suppressed and the slaves be freed with this immediate right of suffrage, their vote might be controlled and a solid south secured for those who had given them the right of voting. But how could the people be led to favor this policy? Various schemes were devised to accomplish the desired end. For a time, efforts were made to induce the North to adopt a policy which Mr. Chase formulated in an interview with Mr. Wade of the Senate and Mr. Ashley of the House, December 11, 1861. Mr. Chase said, a warden, page 390, that a state attempting to secede 
the state government being placed in hostility to the federal government, the state organization was forfeited and it lapsed into the condition of a territory. That we could organize territorial courts, and as soon as it became necessary, a territorial government. That those states could not properly be considered as states in the Union, but must be readmitted from time to time as Congress should provide. Mr. Wade and Mr. Ashley were understood to concur in this doctrine, and as matter of fact, it was given out as sound doctrine and was widely advocated in newspapers and at war meetings engineered by politicians in various parts of the North. Mr. Chase was too good a lawyer not to recognize the absurdity of the doctrine as American law. It was pure secession doctrine at bottom and subversive of the whole system of government in all the states. The firmness of conservative Republicans and the adherence of Mr. Lincoln to the doctrine of the Congressional Resolution kept a large portion of the people from accepting it. Perhaps the greatest service which Mr. Lincoln rendered his country was in the sagacious manner in which he prevented this revolutionary doctrine from becoming the avowed policy of a party. Its success would have been more fatal to the Constitution than the acknowledgment of the Southern Confederacy. The abolition of slavery as a war measure was proposed and advocated at the same time. This was more popular. But neither Mr. Lincoln nor any military authority could perceive its practical use as a weapon of war, and although a tremendous pressure was brought to bear on the President, he steadily refused to issue a bull against a comet. The political position was therefore complicated. The process of coalition by which politicians who had been Democrats as well as Republicans came together and formed the radical wing of the Republican Party is worthy the study of every one interested in the history of popular governments. A powerful combination was formed. It had no leader, for too many of its members were every man for himself, while each was seeking one or another personal benefit. Its common purpose was to manage the war in such a way as to secure control of the country in the elections in 1864 and afterwards. There was a body of noble, conservative, and patriotic men in the old Republican Party strong enough to interpose many obstacles in the way of the radicals. The latter adopted the customary tactics of unscrupulous partisans in this country, and visited on all who opposed them storms of foul epithets and charges of sympathy with the rebellion. Mr. Lincoln was alternately praised and vilified, but no one of the radical coalition was his friend or desired his continuation at the head of the party. Some old Democratic politicians, recognizing good prospects of its success, joined the radical party. Congress, in time, yielded to its control. A committee called the Committee on the Conduct of the War was created, to be the machine of partisan politics, in control of the most unscrupulous leaders of the combination, who used it to good effect in the deception of the confiding people of the country. It is profoundly interesting, and there is something grotesque in it also, to observe how the shrewd and far-seeing Lincoln kept the headship of both elements, conservative and radical, prevented their often threatened division into two parties, defeated each of the rival candidates for his office, and finally compelled his own renomination and their support in his re-election. To secure for their purposes the leader of the armies had been one of the first and most important objects of the radicals. If a victor, he was morally certain to become the idol of the people. What can we make out of McClellan was the question of all. What can I make out of McClellan was the question of each. Thus, in that marvelous apocalypse, his private diary, Mr. Chase writes, Warden, page 500, that a friend said to him, Colonel Key often expressed his regret that McClellan had not conferred with me and acted in concert with me. I replied that I thought if he had that the rebellion would be ended now. I was quite willing he should repeat to McClellan what I had said. Undoubtedly, had McClellan attached himself to Mr. Chase or any other presidential candidate in the manner suggested, he would have been supported by a powerful political combination. But the bargains of politics were foreign to his work and nature. He was creating an army and using it for the people, not for himself, certainly not for Mr. Chase or any other aspirant to position. The success of McClellan in 1862 would have been doubly fatal to the politicians. The old Union would have been restored, and the General would command the political situation. Therefore, McClellan must not be successful, 
his popularity must be destroyed. Whatever of falsehood could be invented must be published concerning him. His successes must be decried. Above all, he must not be allowed to win a decisive victory. Neither a quick ending of the war nor a victorious campaign by McClellan would inure to party success. The argument of personal rivalry and party requirement was pressed on Mr. Lincoln without success. However loyal McClellan was to his country, the Secretary of the Treasury said he urged his removal because he was not loyal to the administration. As it began to be evident that Mr. Lincoln would not adopt the radical policy, nor discharge McClellan and appoint some general suited to radical purposes, nor manage war banners with special regard to future partisan considerations, it became important to gain the War Department and place in it a secretary who would do what the President would not. Thus the course of the war could be controlled, the generals could be driven with reins, the President himself could be deceived, misled, and to some extent managed. Mr. Edwin M. Stanton was selected, and Mr. Chase, with great adroitness described by himself, induced Mr. Lincoln to appoint him as successor to Mr. Cameron. The religious emotion with which Mr. Chase recorded the success of this scheme indicates the view he had of its vital importance to the radical cause. Mr. Stanton was a lawyer of moderate abilities, a man of peculiar mental constitution. Without moral principle or sense of personal honor, he was equally ready to change front in public politics and to betray private friendship, and was therefore eminently suited to the purposes for which he was selected by the men with whom he had formed a secret alliance. But he was as untrustworthy as that in other associations and at the very moment when Mr. Chase, confiding in him, was intriguing to bring him into the cabinet, he betrayed Mr. Chase's confidences and defeated his plans for his own purposes. Those who knew him well were in the habit of describing him as one of those who always kicked down the ladder by which they have climbed. His ambition was unbounded and his self-reliance absolute. He did not depend, as do ordinary politicians, on a larger or smaller body of followers, and political dependence. No one shared his aspirations, and none were to claim gratitude or reward in his successes. All times of great popular excitement and national peril bring into view remarkable characters. None more remarkable than his appears in the history of the Civil War. None will be a more interesting subject to the student of human nature. With opportunity to achieve greatness and win a people's gratitude such as few others had, he used it in such a way that in the calm retrospect of a quarter of a century, his countrymen look at him with sorrowful shame, and few name him with respect, except here and there a survivor of the alliance whose purposes he served. He was supposed to be energetic, but he was only spasmodic, and in his spasms of impulsive judgment and action committed errors costly beyond all measurement in the money of the treasury and the lives of soldiers. Himself honest in money matters, a host of plunderers fattened without check on the money provided by the people and scattered in his improvident and reckless management of the department. With the men and means lavishly placed at his disposal by the people, a war secretary of sound sense, cool discretion, honest purpose, and the good judgment to accept military advice and instruction for military operations, would have conducted the war at an expense of hundreds, where it was thousands of millions." But Mr. Stanton's errors of self-reliance were aggravated by the fact that he not only had no military knowledge, but by his peculiar disposition was incapacitated to receive military instruction. A very foolish letter which he published revealed his ignorance of the simplest principles on which success in war depends. His suspension of all recruiting at the moment of opening active operations in the field was a blunder unparalleled in military history, as well as a crime. His inability to receive military instruction has a singular illustration in a letter recently made public, which he wrote to a friend a few weeks after the siege of Yorktown. When McClellan entered on the Peninsular Campaign, his entire plan of campaign rested on his purpose to throw the First Corps in rear of Yorktown, turn that fortified position, and clear the way for a rapid advance to Richmond. The withdrawal of the First Corps from his army at the very instant it was to have been thus utilized defeated the plan of campaign, rendered necessary the siege of Yorktown, and the adoption of a new plan with a reduced army. Innumerable letters and dispatches besides those given in McClellan's narrative made these facts clear to all, excepting the War Department. 
Mr. Stanton wrote in this private letter to a confidential friend, the force retained from his, McClellan's, expedition was not needed and could not have been employed by him. One of his co-secretaries says that his hostility to McClellan began when he entered the cabinet. He was, indeed, but one of the organized enemy in the rear of the Army of the Potomac and their commander, but he was the executive of their plots as well as of his own. Professing always devoted personal attachment to and admiration of the general, he opened his private correspondence with his wife, circulated with vindictive malice falsehoods and slanders, petty and great, to his injury, misrepresented him to and sought to embroil him with the president, and deliberately planned and executed the defeat of the Peninsular Campaign. The accusation is most grave and terrible, but it was made to him in person by the general of the army, and his reception of it was a confession of its awful truth. For at midnight, June twenty seventh, 28th, when McClellan found his army in the toils into which Mr. Stanton had led them, and there abandoned them, the general, anticipating his own possible death with thousands of the men he loved, sent a dispatch to the secretary the like of which was never sent by commander in the field to superior at home. Every line was weighty, every word solemn. It was the free outpouring of a great soul conscious of the approach of death. There are no erasures in the original draft which lies before me. It concluded with this denunciation. If I save this army now, I tell you plainly that I owe no thanks to you or to any other persons in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice this army. The secretary received the accusation in silence, which was the confession of its truth. If it were not true, McClellan deserved and would have received quick punishment for the gross insubordination, and the country would have justified any imposed penalty. If Mr. Stanton had dared dispute its truth and appeal on the facts to the honest judgment of a court-martial of the country, he would, of course, have done so. Not only did he fail to resent it, but he kept the dispatch secret, and when some time later it was laid before the Committee on the Conduct of the War, the concluding sentences above quoted were suppressed. It appears thus mutilated in that mass of worthless, because falsified and untrustworthy rubbish which forms a large part of the printed report of that committee. The Secretary's personal reply to the General was the affectionate letter of July 3rd professing his devotion. His practical reply was to go with Mr. Chase to the President and urge the sending of General Pope to supersede McClellan. The soldiers of the Union went into the field everywhere with a mind of this sort to use them as it would. If conscience ever asserted itself in that strange mind, always alternating in passionate emotions of anger and fear, the set faces of a half million dead soldiers must have haunted it in waking and sleeping. End of Biographical Sketch Part 1 Biographical Sketch of George B. McClellan Part 2 From McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. While politicians were plotting, McClellan was working. It is impossible to overestimate the laborious character of the general's life. His whole soul was in his work. His every energy and thought was given to it. He was always, while in Washington and while in the field, in the habit of seeing personally, as far as possible, to the execution of important orders. Out of countless illustrations of this which might be given, let one suffice. The lieutenant colonel of that superb regiment, the 1st Connecticut Artillery, wrote to me from the works before Yorktown that a little after midnight the previous rainy night, while the men were at work in the trenches, McClellan rode up, attended by a single orderly, sprang from his horse, inspected the work, gave some directions, remounted, and rode away. About 3 a.m. he reappeared as before, approved the work, gave further directions, and vanished. My correspondent met him at his headquarters before 7 a.m., and also met there a friend whose regiment was stationed some miles away, who told him that the general had surprised them by a visit and inspections at about 2 a.m. The soldiers soon learned not to be surprised at his appearance among them anywhere at any hour of day or night. He made Washington secure. He created the Army of the Potomac. He gathered the vast material for a war. Called to the chief command, 
he brought order out of chaos in all the armies. He organized the first and only plan for the war in all the country. He sent successful expeditions with detailed orders to North Carolina, New Orleans, and elsewhere, in pursuance of his comprehensive scheme, in which concerted action everywhere was to be in direct relation to the chief act, the taking of Richmond. On this plan the war went on after his retirement. When he was ready to wield the vast power he had created, he left Washington at the head of the Army of the Potomac to strike the decisive blow at Richmond. Instantly the operations of the enemy in the rear began. He was removed from the command-in-chief, and no successor appointed. All his comprehensive plan was shattered. The war secretary, succeeding practically to the command, neglected even to carry out his orders for the completion of the defenses of Washington. The subsequent defeat of the Pope was directly chargeable to this neglect, and other like neglects led to other disasters. When he reached the peninsula and met the enemy, his army was suddenly reduced by the withdrawal of one-third of its force. He had planned to turn Yorktown. He now went over it. The country rang with a preconcerted outcry which the politicians raised. The siege of Yorktown was denounced as slow. It occupied less than twenty days and has no parallel for swiftness in the history of the war. The plan of campaign having been overturned by the reduction of the army, the general formed a new plan and advanced rapidly on it. Again the War Department interfered and defeated it, ordering him to stretch his right to the north of Richmond to effect the junction of McDowell's Corps, now promised but to come overland. Again and again McDowell was coming but never came. His advance was within sound of McClellan's cannon when he was finally withdrawn. Assuredly, if the secretary had deliberately planned the destruction of the army, he would have given precisely the orders he did, and would have handled the First Corps exactly as he did handle it. No trap could have been better set by an enemy. Only the consummate generalship of McClellan and the heroism of the Army of the Potomac in the successful battles of the Seven Days saved it from the fate to which it had been consigned. The Army of the Potomac was recalled to Washington instead of being reinforced on the banks of the James. All the lives and all the agonies of the country which were expended in regaining that same position two years afterward were wasted for the only purpose of getting rid of McClellan. There are many open questions in regard to the treatment which McClellan received from the power behind the throne in Washington, which will be answered only when more such records as Mr. Chase's private diary shall be discovered and published. Why was General Halleck authorized to assure McClellan that he was recalled to Washington to take command of the combined forces, his own army and General Pope's? Was there then, and continuously afterward, in the minds of Mr. Stanton and his associates, a fear of McClellan and the army? The charge was not infrequently made that he intended to seize the government. The devotion of the army to him, with their indignation at his and their treatment by the War Department, might arouse apprehension in minds not noted for personal courage. It is no secret that this fear prevailed in the War Department after September 2nd, and especially when the final order was sent relieving McClellan. Possibly such apprehension had something to do with the holding out to the general the idea that he was to command the combined forces, and with the adoption of the plan of withdrawing the army from his command instead of relieving him. That the President had no part in his ultimate purpose can hardly be doubted. He honestly desired to see an army always between Washington and the enemy, nor did he or Mr. Stanton learn till years afterward, when Grant was south of Richmond, the military truth which McClellan reiterated, that the true defense of Washington was on the bank of the James River. It is hardly worth while now to say that if any such fears prevailed among the men in Washington, it was because they could not realize the possible existence of such an upright, pure, and unselfish servant of his country as McClellan. He entertained no thought of anything to be done by him except duty. Absolutely obedient to orders, he accepted as his work whatever his superiors set before him. It was not till the fate of the country depended on his assuming power and exercising it without orders that, staking his life for the people, he led the army to South Mountain and Antietam. There is no passage in the history of any man who has ever lived more startling in the contrast it presents than the story of McClellan's recall and return to Washington. 
the commander who had for months been the victim of political intrigues baffled in every effort to serve his country ordered against his judgment and protest hither and thither by ignorant and inimical superiors the general loving and loved by a great army now removed from his command sat or paced to and fro with a little group of staff officers and a few wounded veterans around him in his tent listening in anxiety beyond words to the sound of distant cannon firing on his old troops and was even compelled to ask the password for the night from the military governor of the small city in whose outskirts his tent was pitched his personal enemies had triumphed the war was now to be very long and very bloody they had effected his disgrace but a few hours changed the scene the defeated army of the union was rushing homeward in broken masses an exultant enemy was marching on the capital the war secretary and the nominal general-in-chief the trustees of the Union and the military heads of the squad of politicians who had brought about the disaster had ordered the arsenal to be emptied and abandoned. It was said also to be burned. Frightened at the awful catastrophe they had caused, the politicians disappeared from sight and were not seen or heard by the people again until, with recovered breath, in assured safety, they reopened their attack on the general toward whom, for the time, all eyes in the land were directed as the only possible savior of his country. The people, in the person of their president, who alone in Washington preserved sound judgment and a serene mind, went to the lately insulted and displaced general, and with tears not unfitting the occasion, for his tears were the emotion of a betrayed and outraged nation, asked him to forget his wrongs and save the country. The falsehood was afterwards circulated that he hesitated, and sought to make conditions. He accepted the new responsibility instantly, for every second was of priceless value. He saved the arsenal which cowardice would have destroyed. The wild scene of joy with which the army received him can never be the subject of the artist's pencil, for it was in the darkness of night, among the Virginia forests, when the good horse of the general, accompanied by one faithful aide, the gallant Colburn, brought him at that tremendous pace the soldiers knew, to meet them retreating, gloomy as the black night that lay on the hills around them. But the wild shout of welcome that rolled from company to company and corps to corps was prophetic of South Mountain and Antietam. Who shall say that the soldiers of the Army of the Potomac did not know that man and that he did not merit their admiring love? He gathered them in his hand. He made a new army of the defeated, disorganized, and decimated regiments of his own army and the Army of Virginia reorganized it, and supplied its pressing needs as it marched, followed and overtook the exultant enemy, flushed with success, in Maryland, and in fifteen days after that night of disastrous retreat, led his heroic troops to the victorious fields of South Mountain and Antietam. It is one of the settled truths of history that constant reiteration of a statement, however untrue, will impress many minds with its truthfulness. The impatience of the people afforded to the enemies of McClellan the opportunity to represent him as constitutionally slow. There are not a few who believe it. There was no foundation for the slur, and anyone who studies dates and informs himself of the actual time occupied by him in any of his work will be surprised at the currency which such a criticism obtained. He was calm and cool in judgment, never impulsive, but always as rapid in action as the circumstances required. If campaigns are to be compared, it is well to note that in the West Virginia and Maryland campaigns, he was his own master and director, while the Peninsular campaign was actually three several campaigns, so made by the interference of the War Department, and all three subject to that constant interference. The order of August 30th had removed McClellan from command of the Army of the Potomac. The order of September 2nd had only placed him in command of the fortifications of Washington. The history of this order is sufficiently discussed in a note on page 538, etc. He had, for the safety of the country and the preservation of the Union, assumed command and fought the battles of South Mountain and Antietam with a halter around his neck. No change was made in his command after the Battle of Antietam. The entire confidence with which he had received the orders of the President on the morning of September 2nd was characteristic. When asked afterward why he did not on that occasion ask written orders, he replied, with a smile, It was no time for writing, and in fact I never thought of it. 
The president fully approved of his determination not to lead the army on an offensive campaign into Virginia without shoes, clothing, and supplies, and without horses for cavalry and transportation. The table, which will be found on pages 632, 633 of this volume, demonstrates beyond cavil both the necessities of the troops and the dates at which they were supplied. Without supplies, cavalry, or transportation, no general would have moved an hour sooner than he did. When ready, he moved with his accustomed rapidity and skill. The movement accomplished his purpose. He had placed the enemy at a fatal disadvantage. If he were brought to battle, there was no reasonable doubt that McClellan had so divided him that he would be beaten in detail. If he declined battle, the Army of the Potomac had the inside track in a race to Richmond. In either event, McClellan was about to win another and decisive victory. Someone reported to the politicians in Washington the imminent danger of a great Union victory by the Army under McClellan. Perhaps when time reveals correspondence, it will be known who sent the intelligence. McClellan's dispatches had communicated facts, not expectations. There was no visible reason for interfering with him at this moment. But the final pressure now brought to bear on the President was successful. He issued a discretionary order to General Halleck, who made haste to exercise the discretion at once, and November 5, 1862, McClellan was ordered to turn over the command to Burnside and go to Trenton, New Jersey. He lies there now on a hill overlooking the Delaware. But he never received there or elsewhere order, thanks, or any recognition from the government of his country. Nor did he ever expect or desire it. To him, as to all pure minds, the ample compensation for labor and self-sacrifice was in the consciousness of duty done. He held himself in readiness to serve the cause should his services be needed, but they were not sought. In 1864, the political elements were still in a chaotic condition. Two parties had been evolved from the exciting conditions caused by the war and the ambitions of politicians. The great body of conservative men were practically unattached to either. The Democratic Party nominated him for the presidency. His reluctant acceptance of the nomination was a new service, not his smallest, to the Republic, concentrating the conservative element in the country on a platform which he made for himself in his letter of acceptance, placing his supporters firmly on the principle of supporting the war and prosecuting it vigorously till the Union and Constitution should be established in safety. How many votes he received will never be known, for the count was in the hands of those who had not scrupled to defeat him in battles with the enemies of the Union. The soldiers' votes were effectually disposed of by the Secretary of War. He had not expected to be elected, and the result was a great relief to him. His earnest desire had always been to regain the enjoyments of home life, of which he had had so brief an experience. He resigned his commission as Major General in the Army on the day of the presidential election, November 8, 1864, and immediately sought work as a civilian for the support of his family. But the bitterness of political enmity followed him into private life. His eminent abilities made his services desirable to many great corporations, and he was offered one and another position of honorable employment, such as he desired. In each case he is certain that the offer was made by a majority over a minority who had strong prejudices against him and opposed his appointment. Acceptance was impossible to him under such circumstances. In January 1865, he went to Europe with his family. His reasons were sad enough, expressed to me in a sentence I well remember. I cannot find a place to earn my living here, and I am going to stay abroad till I am forgotten, then come back and find work, which I may get when these animosities have cooled down. But the people would not forget him. In 1868, when it was rumored that he was coming home, soldiers and citizens proposed to receive him with honors. He wrote emphatically protesting against any such demonstration and after his return insisted on declining it. The demand of his old comrades and friends became so pressing that he at last consented to receive a procession on a designated evening a few days in advance, provided it should be spontaneous without previous advertisement in newspapers. He expected a few hundred old soldiers and friends in an affair of a few minutes. Instead, he received the most impressive ovation which has ever been given to a private citizen of this country perhaps not excepting those in times of the highest political excitement. The vast and broad procession of men who honored him passed hour after hour in front of the balcony on which he stood, 
while fifty or a hundred thousand crowded the street and square to witness and share in the demonstration. At midnight that night he said to me, Well, it is over now, and I hope I can be quiet hereafter. But an American with such a hold on the hearts of people cannot be quiet. There was no man in America up to the day of his death to whom so many of his fellow citizens were attached by ties of affection and respect. There was what men call a magnetism about him which won all hearts. The politician, such a man, honest and unapproachable, is always a subject of apprehension. Party politicians, Democrats as well as Republicans, feared him as a possible rival or opponent. He received no favors from either, and to his death owed no gratitude to either party or any of their leaders. He was as carefully neglected by one as by the other except when his great personal influence was wanted in a political campaign. He established his residence, known as Maywood, on Orange Mountain, in New Jersey, where he built a house, and brought around him treasures of literature and art, memorials of faithful friends, of far travel, of scenes in his life which were pleasant to remember. Conspicuous in his own room was a shining mass of the long black hair of the horse Dan Webster, faithful among the faithful on a score of battlefields. In 1877, he was elected governor of New Jersey. Had it been possible for Democratic Party politicians to control the nomination, he would not have been selected. His administration was eminently successful, rich in benefit to the educational, industrial, and judicial systems of the state, and wholly free from partisanship. And here it may be added that his experience had taught him to recognize the party politician whenever he came into contact with one, and to estimate him at his precise worth. He had accepted the governorship, urged on him, as an opportunity of doing good service to his state, but he was glad when the end of his term of office came. He had resolved to pass the remainder of his life as a private citizen. During its later years he went abroad several times, to Europe, Egypt, and the Holy Land, enjoying travel and study and the pleasure of warm social intercourse with many of the most distinguished soldiers, statesmen, and scholars of various countries, who were his correspondents and friends. His ample knowledge of modern languages made him at home in all countries, and enabled him to accumulate stores of information. He was thoroughly familiar with the progress of political as well as military thought and events in Europe and at home. In the autumn of 1885, he had several severe attacks of pain in the region of the heart. After one of these, he yielded to the advice of his excellent physician and remained at home, resting for some days. On the afternoon of October 28th, he drove out with his daughter and passed the evening in pleasant conversation with his family. Towards eleven o'clock, after the evening prayers, which were the family custom, he went to the working room, wrote for a brief time, and then went to bed, taking, as he generally did, a book which he read for a while. A sharp attack of the same acute pain suddenly seized him. The physician, summoned to his side, administered remedies, but the agony continued. He left his bed for a large chair in which he sat. No expression of suffering escaped him. On the contrary, he spoke only cheerfully and pleasantly to the servants whom he was sorry to call up, and to his wife and daughter to whom he once in a while addressed a bright word of affection. About three o'clock in the morning he looked towards Mrs. McClellan and said in a low voice to the physician, Tell her I am better now. The next moment his head rested on the chair back and the good soldier was gone. The rewards which are withheld here, whether by reason of the malice of enemies or the neglect of friends, are of no account there. His funeral was, in accordance with his own wishes, often expressed, that of a private citizen. His body was brought to New York to my house, in which he had always been at home. While thousands of citizens filled the neighboring streets, he lay lifelike, and around him stood a group of great men. The commanders of the opposing armies, which had met at Yorktown and in the Peninsular Campaign, were both there, one living, the other dead. Strong men, generals, old soldiers of many battlefields, his comrades and his foes, looked at his calm face. I have never seen, never expect to see again, such a scene, so many stout men in tears. Such eyes shed tears only for the great and good. Then followed the simple services in the Madison Square Presbyterian Church of which he had been a member until he became a ruling elder in the church at Orange. From the church he was carried to Trenton. Great throngs awaited the arrival of the train at the station, and crowded the streets through which the procession passed for two miles. 
thousands of silent mourners were assembled in the cemetery. His grave was in his private plot on a hill overlooking the flow of the Delaware. A clergyman, one who loved him, said the last words of faith and hope as he was laid in the grave. So we buried him. Most public men live two lives, the one at which the people see, the other that which none see unless it be a few intimate friends and companions of ours of freedom. McClellan, the soldier and patriot, is well known to the people, has been diversely judged by them according to the amount of correct information they have received, and according to those prejudices of political and other associations which affect all our opinions of public men of our own time. Whatever be their judgment of the soldier and statesman, few if any outside of the circle of his intimate friends have had any idea of the real man. Public men are too often measured by the familiar standards of public life. He was a man such as we seldom know. His experiences in life were varied. Educated as a soldier, he had devoted his life to the profession and was one of the most accomplished military scholars of the world. His military library was large, in various languages, always increasing, every book thoroughly studied. He continued these studies faithfully to his death. Military operations in every part of the world commanded his close observation. He supplied himself with maps and all information in current literature, followed movements of armies, kept himself familiar with every phase of campaigns, whether in Europe, in Afghanistan, in Egypt, or in South Africa. While this was his professional study, he occupied himself with almost equally thorough study of subjects very remote from military matters. He was a general student of the literature of the world. He read freely most of the languages of Europe, and kept up with the progress of thought and discussion in history, philosophy, and art. He was especially interested in archaeology, and having all his life retained and used his knowledge of ancient languages, found abundant delight in reading archaeologic publications and in following the work of explorers. In all departments of scholarly reading he was constant and unwearying, and he never forgot what he had once learned. Fitted by his attainments for the society of the learned, he had the marked characteristic of the true scholar, the desire to know more, and therefore the habit of seeking instead of offering information. Few suspected his mastery of subjects on which he only asked questions when thrown in contact with recognized masters. In general conversation he more frequently sought information than gave it, but when drawn out to give it his expression was concise, vigorous, clear. His extended knowledge of ancient and modern languages made him master of his own. His public papers are models of pure style. His habit of writing was swift, and he never hesitated for the precise word to express the exact shade of meaning he intended. His dispatch books, containing the autograph originals of his dispatches during the war, are marvels, since with whatever haste he wrote, he wrote without erasure or alteration on subjects where each word was of vital importance. That his life was one of constant occupation may be judged from what has been said. He had no idle hours, for those cannot be called idle which were given to social duties and the enjoyments of that home life whose beauty and happiness were perfect. His wife and children were his companions, and a perpetual sunshine was in the household. He was full of cheer, life, vigor, always ready for whatever would make any one of them happy. And this leads me to say that of all men I have ever known, McClellan was the most unselfish. Never in his public life nor in his private life did he ever seek anything for himself. He was constantly doing something for someone else, always seeking to do good, confer pleasure, relieve sorrow, gratify a whim, do something for another. He had his own amusements, but in those he sought the good of others. He had devoted a great deal of attention to ceramic art, and had collected many fine examples. He was an excellent judge of genuineness of specimens, but his love of old China was not for mere pleasure, it was for historical and industrial considerations and New Jersey owes him a vastly larger debt than she knows for the great advance made in her pottery productions through his special personal efforts while and after he was governor of that state. In his elegant home, with ample table furniture of old historic porcelains, gathered with admirable judgment and taste in his European trips, he was especially proud of and fond of using and showing beautiful services made at Trenton and potteries which he often visited, and to whose advancement he had, while governor and afterward directed earnest attention. 
The personal affection which existed between McClellan and the soldiers of the Army of the Potomac is historical. It grew with years on both sides. On his it was a marked trait of his character. He would make great sacrifices of his own pleasure and comfort to render a service to any one of them. They were a vast family, and not a few of them came to him for aid in distress. None came in vain. His charity was abundant. He sympathized with every one who was in trouble or sorrow, and his sympathy was practical and useful, for his person and his purse were devoted to its uses. An Irish servant in a New York house saw her brother's name in the list of killed at Antietam, and started off forthwith to find his grave. When she came back, she told her story to the family. She found her way to the battlefield, and after a while to the graves where someone told her the men of her brother's regiment were buried. It was a lonesome place above ground then, for the army had moved away. She was searching among the graves for a familiar name on the stakes when she saw, riding down the road which passed at some distance from the burial place, what she called a lot of soldiers on horseback. When they came abreast of her, the leader, who was a little in advance, called a halt, sprang to the ground, and walked across the open field to her. "'What are you looking for, my good woman?' he said. She told him. "'What was your brother's regiment?' she answered. "'You are only one of thousands who want to know today where their dead are lying here,' he said. "'I hope you will find your brother's grave. Don't mourn too much for him. He died a soldier's death.' Then turning, he called, "'Orderly?' A soldier came. "'Stay with this woman and help her find her brother's grave. Report to me this evening.' and he went back, remounted, and the company rode on at a gallop. After a while the orderly found the grave, and she knelt there and prayed. Then she asked the soldier, Who was that gentleman that told you to help me? That, said the orderly. Why didn't you know him? That was little Mac. God bless him, I said, was the end of her story. Innumerable like prayers of grateful souls of men and women, with those words, God bless him, have battered the gates of heaven. It is surely unnecessary to say that he was a gentleman in every sense of the word. In social life he was perfectly simple in his manner, wholly unaffected, always genial, having rare conversational powers with all classes of persons, devoutly respectful to ladies. This deference to the female sex was a marked characteristic. I note an illustration of it which I find in many of his private letters, some in this volume. One at the head of the army, and occupying a position only second to the president, he received thousands of visitors who came from mere curiosity, introduced by senators or others to see the young general. In mentioning such visits, he invariably says that he was presented to the ladies, never uses what would have been a perfectly correct expression under the circumstances, the ladies were presented to me. In person, McClellan was five feet nine inches tall, with great breadth of shoulders and solid, not superfluous, muscle. He measured 45 inches around the chest. His physical strength in his younger life was very great. He seldom exerted it in later years. He contracted disease in the Mexican War, which never wholly left him, and which doubtless somewhat impaired his strength. But in 1863 I have seen him bend a quarter dollar over the end of his thumb by pressure between the first and second finger of his hand. That same evening we were sitting together, three, one of whom was a distinguished officer who weighed over 250, they tell me, General, said I, that McClellan can throw you over his head. So they say was a somewhat uncertain response. McClellan sprang from his chair and crossed the room rapidly with his hand stretched out to seize the giant. Let me alone, General, he exclaimed. Let me alone. He can do it. He has done it. He can toss me in his arms like a baby. To the very last day of his life, his step was quick, firm, elastic, the expression of that uniform cheerfulness, buoyancy, and enjoyment of life which he possessed and which he always communicated to those around him. I think I shall be understood in saying that his physical bearing was such that of all men he was the very last with whom those who knew him could connect any thought of death. I have left to the last to speak of the controlling feature of McClellan's character and life. His religion was deep, earnest, practical, not vague or ill-defined to himself or others, not obtrusive, but outspoken when occasion required, and when outspoken, frank and hearty. For it was part and parcel of his soul. I must use brief words, and I seek to make them distinct in defining his creed, which was clear as crystal, more steadfast than the hills, the faith once delivered to the saints in its pure simplicity. 
with his intellectual powers which were of the highest and with his heart which was supremely gentle as trustful all his life as any child's he was servant and follower of jesus christ in whom he believed as god of god in all his life public and private every purpose was formed every act done in the light of that faith it was this which not only produced in him that stainless purity of walk and conversation which all who knew him recognized, but also gave him strength for all the great works of a great life. It was this which created that magnetic power so often spoken of, won to him that marvelous devotion of his soldiers, made all who knew him regard him with affection, those who do him best love him most. Out of the private correspondence which has come into my hands, I have selected, and ventured to make public here, two letters. These, better than anything I can say, will serve to open, for those who only knew him as a public man, a view of that inner life, his real life, which he lived among his familiar friends. New York, August 18, 1879 My dear General, passing through South Street, I saw a magnificent yacht-like ship, apparently new, called the General McClellan. You have probably seen her. If not, she deserves a visit. I am sure you are tired of being governor or anything else, for no matter what the title be, the result is always the same. Work, work unceasingly. Now suppose we gather our household gods and sail away in this good ship until we come to the land where it is always afternoon. This would be better than Orange Mountain or the Salt Sea of Long Island. With kind regards to Mrs. McClellan, believe me, yours, S. L. M. Barlow. General McClellan. Orange, September 3, 1879. My dear Sam, your welcome note of the 18th August reached me when on the point of starting off for a trip from home. I was very glad to see those leaning back characters once more. Some years ago I saw, near Mr. Alsop's office, a ship named for me, probably the same you saw the other day. I fancy, Sam, that we will never reach that land where it is always afternoon in any ship built by mortal hands. Our fate is to work, and still to work, as long as there is any work left in us, and I do not doubt that it is best. For I can't help thinking that, when we reach that other and far better land, we shall still have work to do throughout the long ages. Only we will then see, as we go on, that it is all done for the Master, and under his own eye, and we will like it and never grow weary of it as we often do here when we don't clearly see to what end we are working, and our work brings us in contact with all sorts of men and things not pleasant to rub against. I suppose that the more we work here, the better we shall be trained for that other work, which, after all, is the great end towards which we move, or ought to be moving. Well, I did not start out to sermonize, but somehow or other your letter started my thoughts in that direction. I would like to take the belongings and sail for that quiet land, but we will have to wait some little time yet, and I suppose each one will reach it alone, and the first arrived wait for the others. I hear that Elsie is to leave you in October. Is it possible that time can fly so rapidly? Before many years, May will perhaps leave us, and just now we are getting ready to send Max to boarding school. An awful business, as you can tell from your own experience in sending Pete to Dr. Colt's. I think this scattering of children is the wrong wrench we get down here but there is nothing to be done but do the best for them as we understand it, and to thank God they don't and can't feel it as we do. What changes since we first crossed the Atlantic together? How many years ago? What a mess in politics! I am trying to take the least possible interest in such matters, as the only way to keep one's temper. Mrs. McClellan unites with me in love to Mrs. Barlow, Elsie, and yourself, and I am always your friend, George B. McClellan, SLMB. In editing this volume for the press, I have tried to do that which my friend would approve. The discretion which he gave me was ample. I have exercised it by omissions, not by changes. Of course his work was unfinished when he left it. Living prepared for the call whenever it might come, serving God as he had served his country, always ready for whatever command he might receive, it is nevertheless certain that, when the order came to go to duty in another life, he was not expecting it. In writing his memoirs, he had made no haste to complete them. Probably, had he lived to extreme old age, there would still have been much to be written. For years after the Civil War, he declined to write anything about it. He had no anxieties for himself and his own reputation. 
an abiding faith in time and the calm judgment of his country kept him from any care about the misstatements misrepresentations and falsehoods of which he more than perhaps any american who had lived before him excepting washington had been made the subject besides he always gave less thought to himself and his own reputation than any man i ever knew or heard of he was a man of very deep feeling with the passions of all ardent souls but so absolute had become his habitual self-control and subjection of all passionate resentment, so complete the self-abnegation which characterized him, I can affirm with certainty that he always felt more sorrow for the man who maligned him than for himself. Once, when I showed him a slander, a pure fabrication, which had been published on the authority of General Burnside, he read it, laid down the magazine with a quiet laugh, said, Poor Burn, he didn't know what he was saying, and after a few kindly words about his old friend, dropped the subject. In vain he was urged to publish the demonstrations he possessed of the falsehood of this and similar attacks. His happiness in life consisted in what he was always doing for others, without thought of self. As he had never sought position, command, or promotion, so he never asked his countrymen to give him honor or thanks. It was only when I urged on him that his children had a right to possess his own story that he took the subject into consideration. Afterward, while in Europe, he began to write out personal reminiscences, which from time to time he continued after his return to America. A fire destroyed all his manuscript. In 1881, he resumed the work. He did not labor at it continuously, with intent to produce a book, but wrote as the humor seized him. His report, made in 1863, but held back by the War Department for some months, had been full, accurate, and exhaustive. It was published in 1864. No statement in it has ever been controverted. This report did not include any accounts of his personal relations to the civilians, who directed the course of political events and misdirected military operations during the first two years of the war. These accounts he wrote, accompanying them with letters, dispatches, documents, whatever might throw light on history. He rewrote and extended a large part of the military history which his report had given in brief, and from time to time inserted pages of manuscript here and there, in those parts of it which he had not rewritten. Thus, as years passed, he was extending and annotating a history, at all times complete in itself as a narrative, and, however long he had lived, would probably have enriched it from year to year with more and more of interesting material. His sudden death interrupted the progress of his work. When I came to examine the collected and arranged papers which he entrusted to me, verbally while living, and by his last will, I found not only the narrative which I have styled McClellan's own story, but sufficient illustrative and explanatory documents, letters, and dispatches to form several volumes. He had not written with reference to publication. It was expressly for his children that he was preparing his memoirs, and there was a great deal in them which was intended solely for their eyes. A century hence, every word, perhaps, might be interesting to those who enjoy personal memoirs, but as a matter of course, it has been my duty to withhold such portions as I think he would not have published now. I have exercised my discretion in reserving for future publication much of the material he had arranged, which would now be valuable and doubtless acceptable, but would have extended this volume to a series of two or three. All the footnotes in the volume are mine. Another class of material came into my hands. McClellan had been married only a few months before the outbreak of the war. Not the least sacrifice which he made in entering the service was the breaking up of the home, his first home, in which he had found the first happiness of a laborious life. Sometimes during his public service Mrs. McClellan was able to be with him, especially while he was in Washington. When they were separated he found his only rest and refreshment in writing to her. To no other person in the world did he open his whole soul. The perfection of their love, the absolute confidence which he reposed, and wisely reposed, in her, made his letters not only graphic accounts of daily events, great and small, but an exposure of his inmost feelings. I found among his papers some extracts from these letters, which he had made to aid him in writing his memoirs, but the letters were supposed to have vanished in the fire. When they were discovered, carefully sealed for the one only person to whom they belonged, I asked for fuller extracts. I confess that I hesitated very much about giving any part of these letters, written in the most sacred confidence of life to the public eye. Others advised that, as he belonged to his country, and innumerable citizens and soldiers loved him with devout affection, they could well be allowed, had indeed a right, 
to read portions of those letters which reveal McClellan the man, as his narrative shows McClellan the soldier. By far the larger portion of the letters, and of every letter, belongs to that confidence which not even death affects. In determining what parts may and what may not be published, I have been influenced by the wish to present to his fellow citizens who honored him, and his soldiers who loved him, some of that view of his character which those nearest to him always had. And I have done this with the guiding trust that he will approve what I have done when I again meet him. W. C. Prime, August 10, 1886 End of Biographical Sketch, Part 2